Welcome to episode four of Nation Rising, our documentary that examines local history in the perspective of the national story. I'm standing here at the grave of Joel Crosby in Evergreen Cemetery. It's a most appropriate place to open episode four, but I will tell you a little story before we start. Earlier today, there was some thought that we would film the beginning of episode four in a completely different place. Uh, at the top of North Manusauk Hill. And for a variety of reasons, we abandoned that plan and decided to come here. Today is October 21, and interestingly enough, the two places we're gonna film in here is not only the grave of Joel Crosby, but the grave of Jonas Kendall Jr. Joel Crosby died on October 20th, 1833, and Jonas Kendall Jr. died on October 22nd, 1844. So here we are, smack dab in the middle of those two dates. Uh, a tremendous coincidence, of course, uh, that probably destined this filming to be here today at Evergreen Cemetery. In any event, this grave is a very appropriate place to launch episode four because episode four talks about the transition of centuries from the 18th century to the 19th century in the transition of the nation from the watchful and uh, good leadership of General Washington to a more uncertain future. The nation was brand new, it was a fledgling country, and there was a lot of uh, difficult waters to navigate. There's nobody that lived in Lemister that probably knew President or General Washington any better than Joel Crosby because he happened to be one of his bodyguards during the Revolutionary War. Joel Crosby moved here in 1790, and when he came, he instantly became a leader in Lemonster, having served in the legislature, served in local government, and uh, was very instrumental in early Lemonster history. While John Adams would steer the new nation through a turbulent time, he would not escape politics or political opportunities created by those difficult years. The masterful and brilliant James Madison was hard at work championing the Republican cause, and at its head, he would install his fellow Virginian, Thomas Jefferson. Our election of 1800 pits the Federalist, Adams, and the Republican, Jefferson. It was the first American presidential election involving organized political parties. The two old friends, veterans of the Continental Congress and members of the committee charged with the drafting of the Declaration of Independence, were about to engage in a politically charged election. That election pitted Federalists wanting to preserve trade with Great Britain and avoid war against Republicans who favored the French, longtime enemy of Britain. The Federalists wanted a strong central government. The Republicans favored a simple government directed by the states and an agrarian economy. The 1800 presidential election was the nation's fourth. It was the first conducted under a law passed by the Massachusetts legislature, which dispensed with any popular vote for presidential electors. The Massachusetts presidential electors were chosen solely by the Massachusetts legislature. Jonas Kendall, the Kendall Tavern's proprietor, was elected to that legislature for the first time in the spring of 1800. In the autumn of 1800, he and his fellow representatives were called on to select 16 presidential electors who ultimately cast their votes for president. Brother! Brother! Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought I'd join you some fine company and perhaps a libation or two. Absolutely, sir. Settle in. As interesting as you fellows may be, a drink or two enhances. Have you settled upon your drink, or should I say delivery this evening? I find the cider, through a certain process of age, has taken on a most, most agreeable quality. And I recommend the same to you, my dear brother. Tell me, Mr. Kendall, 
Why did you obtain this fine, hard cider? It cuts in John Buss's best offering, and it comes to me at a dollar a barrel. Well, I'd be happy to try the same, but Johnny gave it to me. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> not your <laughs> And I see you sup on a traditional meal. Yes. You know? But, uh, what, well, you've lost your taste for, uh, all the other things that you usually like to eat? The snakes and the wood ducks and the... Recently, a young lawyer at the Worcester Session asked me quite publicly if I've ever dined on turtles <laughs> or stewed polywogs. I informed him that I had not, that such a dinner would not prove injurious to me, but would be a disaster for his entrance. Abandoning the art of cross-examination, the young fellow asked me a question to which he did not know the answer. No lawyer does that. He asked me why. And I told him, it is well known and appreciated, that stewed polywogs and some developers killed Gosling. <laughs> Well, on second thought, I might have a little bit of fortification. <laughs> Would that be a request for the Kendall Tavern flip? Oh, yes, I'd love a little bit of rum with the egg and the cider. <laughs> no budget. <problem. laughs> but I'm very careful that my friends don't get at loggerheads with each other. But, Counselor, it appears that your brother at the bar has now arrived. Good evening, Councillor Bigelow. I'm happy that the weather has not deterred you from your company at the Lodge, brethren. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, brother. <laughs> and I believe we will be entertained by a fine fiddler, Ishmael Perry, who will be playing up at the ballroom at your Lodge meeting next Thursday. I know we're doubly blessed <laughs> with the two fine legal minds, or are we doubly cursed by fellows who can create more havoc with paper than a strongest tempest? Mr. Johnson, I'll focus on the first part of your comment and dismiss the last. And with the hospitality of our proprietor, I'll join you fellows. I hope my comments do not offend, but there are several, even in our local population, who do not hold you fellow lawyers in the highest regard. <laughs> the telescope printed, and I have it right here, I want to read it to you. What, and what are your feelings at the sight of a child wandering in beggary, whose father you caused, your cause you rejected because he was poor? Or whose father you were instrumental in depriving him of his state because a wealthy villain was your client. Well, Mr. Kendall, yes, sir. how do you perceive this noble profession now that you've had a chance to sit in our legislature? What did I read in Poor Richard's Almanac just the other day? Men and melons are hard to know. And that will be the case next month when you fellows in the legislature decide the presidents. I can never understand how we get duped out of our vote by you fellows in the legislature, learned counsel. Does this mean we have no vote for the presidency? Indeed, indeed it does. Those dandies in the legislature will do the only choosing, and for the first time since our Constitution was ratified, we citizens in the Commonwealth have no vote. No vote for president. Have our liberties grown in the last generation? Or have they shrunk before our eyes? What next? <laughs> no vote for governor? No vote for Congress? Notice, yes, do you see any chance that your legislature will elect a single Republican elector? Or does John Adams have you all in a frivolous grasp? Well, he surely has the Boston crowd. I mean, just look at the vote for Governor Strong. But Tom Jefferson has some sway out here in the West. Some following, too. Gentlemen, the telescope predicted a prediction back in July, just before the anniversary of the Declaration. They suggest 16 aristocratical votes to zero Republican by the Massachusetts electors. They do, however, predict a resounding Republican vote in all the states we counted. Didn't that prediction give all of the New York electors to the Republicans? Indeed. The better question is, which Republican? Mr. Burr or Mr. Jefferson? Well, I assume you mis mean Mr. Jefferson. You mean the Jacobite? Well, he may lean towards the French, but who amongst us can deny their assistance? Especially you, Councillor Johnson. 
Well, I was elected on April 19, 1775. When? April 19, 1775. <laughs> I escaped the British at Halifax, commanded a British vessel, and did all this without any Frenchman in sight. None! I understand that prize money came in pretty handy at Harvard, along with their financial aid application. <laughs> On November 14, 1800, the Massachusetts Legislature certified 16 electors to vote for president and vice president. Not surprisingly, all of the electors ultimately voted for the Federalist presidential and vice presidential candidates, John Adams and Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, respectively. The result of the choice of electors was reported locally in the telescope on November 20th, 1800. On December 3rd, 1800, as required by law, the electors convened and cast their votes for president and vice president. The election predated the 12th Amendment to the United States Constitution, and therefore a candidate ostensibly running for vice president could have been elected president had he received the requisite majority of electoral votes. The New England states backed John Adams solidly. Adams received all of the electoral votes of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. The Federalist vice presidential candidate, likewise, received all of the possible votes but one since a Rhode Island elector cast his vote for John Jay, making it symbolically clear that Adams was the presidential candidate and Pinckney the vice presidential candidate. The bitter campaign, especially in New York, cost the Federalists all of the 12 electoral votes allotted to the state. Alexander Hamilton, a Federalist who disliked Adams more than Jefferson, vilified the president in an October missive which pointed out flaws in Adams' character including disgusting egotism, eccentric tendencies, bitter animosity, weakness, and vacillation. Hamilton's electioneering was effective, especially on his local turf of New York City. Additionally, ambitious Aaron Burr a Republican vice presidential candidate also effectively campaigned in New York City for the Republicans. Despite the loss of the New York electoral votes, the election was not finally decided against Adams until a close contest in South Carolina was lost. Ultimately, Thomas Jefferson received 73 electoral votes and Aaron Burr also received the same 73 votes and John Adams received 65 votes. While Adams lost the presidency, his showing in the Electoral College vote has been deemed significant given the challenges and crises faced during his administration. With Adams cast aside, the tie in the Electoral College between Jefferson and Burr was ultimately decided in the House of Representatives. It took 36 ballots over six days in the talk of civil war to finally end the deadlock and elect Thomas Jefferson president. Ironically, Thomas Jefferson, who envisioned an agrarian nation comprised of small farms interspersed over a rural countryside, was elected president largely on a 250 vote disparity in New York City, already one of the nation's largest urban centers. Adams did not stay in the new capital city long enough to greet the new president or participate in his inauguration. Instead, he retired to Quincy and, except for a few terse letters upon the change in power, did not communicate with his old friend and colleague, Thomas Jefferson, for more than 12 years. With victory secured, Jefferson was inaugurated as president on March 4, 1801. His inaugural address has reverberated over the decades chiefly for the principle that once the turbulence of electoral politics is done, the victor encourages a binding of wounds, a working together as one country. 
The new president famously said, We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. He went on to promise an honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Jefferson the president soon learned that governing was not the same as advancing the theories of a campaign. The pacifist Jefferson had a plan to dismantle a portion of the U.S. Navy. The Navy was important to protecting the nation's shipping, an activity largely promoted by Federalists. The importance of the Navy to the young nation's defense was soon learned. As one could imagine, the Navy, the fledgling American Navy, was of crucial importance in the early years of the Republic. And one particular event does uh, mark the difficulties that our Navy was having. Uh, the USS Philadelphia, one of our uh, flagships of, the, of, our, of our fleet, ran aground off the coast of Tripoli. And uh, whilst it was trying to free itself uh, from its predicament, the Bay of Tripoli was able to take all of the 300 plus sailors on board hostage and then demand from the US government millions of dollars for their release. And that's when uh, the American foreign policy and the famous phrase, millions for defense but not a cent for tribute, was really born. And uh, since that date and to the current, uh, we as an American uh, government and our foreign policy is consistent that we don't deal with hostage takers uh, or terrorists. Um, what happened in the wake of that hostage taking was a gentleman from Brimfield, Massachusetts named William Eaton was enlisted to go on a mission to help free those hostages. His mission started in Egypt with a number of Americans, but also a force of British mercenaries that made their way across the North African continent to Tripoli to try to descend upon the uh, Bay of Tripoli's uh, outer defenses and free these hostages. He never completed the mission. He got very close uh, to, the, to Tripoli and was ready to go in and complete the mission. And before he could complete the mission, the US government ended up paying the Bay of Tripoli $60,000 to free those hostages. A pittance compared to what was originally demanded and Eaton was none too happy about it because he was on the precipice of completing that mission in a very effective way, in an efficient way. And um, in any event, we, when the U.S. government says that they don't deal with hostage takers or uh, terrorists, it's not always entirely true, and it hasn't been true really since the beginning. In any event, Eaton came back to the United States as a hero, and the first place he was celebrated was in Norfolk, Virginia. In the edit of the Richmond Enquirer was the first person in America to write a story about Eaton's mission. And interestingly enough, that editor, Charles Prentice, happened to start in the newspaper business right here in Lemister as the editor of our telescope, which was published just a year before that in 1800. Military strength was not the only policy for which Jefferson had to reverse himself. On April 30th, 1803, the Louisiana Purchase Treaty was signed, adding a staggering 823,000 square miles to the United States for a payment of $15 million to Napoleon's France. Jefferson saw no choice. A pact between Spain and France left Napoleon an unchecked menace in the West. A negotiated settlement made the most sense and avoided an eventual war with France, a one that the young nation might not be able to win. In Lemonster, like other small towns across the nation, everyday life went on. Farms were tilled, young industries tended to, and children educated. From 1796 to 1803, the town voted an appropriation for education in the amount of $666 annually. Lemonster was divided into seven school wards. Six of the wards 
received $100 per year, and the seventh ward, presumably because of its smaller size, received $66. From its beginning, Lemonster prided itself for the practice of funding its various school wards equally. In many towns, the ward school was financed by the families it served, as opposed to the entire town. This, of course, permitted wealthier sections of a community advantages over those with less financial capacities. In a town meeting held on April 7, 1806, the moderator presented a report by a committee established to study school overcrowding. The committee was chaired by Major Metaphor Chase, a shopkeeper who maintained a store at the present-day site of the Unitarian Church on West Street. Chase's committee recommended a new 8th Ward School, and the town voted to approve the same. To the moderator and inhabitant of the town of Lemonster and town meeting assembled April 7, 1806, that, in our opinion, a new ward to be denominated, number 8, the house of which to be placed near Mr. Alpheus Stewart's, and to be composed of the following families. This would be the best means for the present, for the town to pursue in order to relieve some of their schools from the extra number of scholars which attend them, and would be most conducive to the interest and harmony of the town. Respectfully submitted by order of committee. Metaphor Chase, Chairman. From 1806 to 1815, the town appropriated the sum of $800 annually to be divided equally among the eight school wards. At the town's May meeting in 1806, the freeholders adopted a recommendation by the committee comprised of Calvin Hale, John Simmons, Jacob Fulham, Thomas Lincoln, and John Buss to appropriate $250 to build the new Ward 8 schoolhouse. The demand for manufactured goods was great in New England towns like Lemonster. The young industries of the new nation could not keep up with the call for many wares that were imported from America's primary trade partner, Great Britain. Those goods were brought to Lemonster by traders like Jonas and Jotham Johnson, brothers of attorney Asa Johnson. Jonas and Jotham made their way over the roads like the Union Turnpike, a passage connecting the 5th Massachusetts Turnpike at the base of North Manusnock Hill to Concord. Legend has it, children could scamper to the attic of the Kendall Tavern and peer out a small window to see riders heading toward them on the Union Turnpike from miles away. The Johnson brothers not only brought goods to town, but maintained the store as well. Wilder notes that the brothers kept a variety goods store for many years, by which inhabitants were really accommodated. Shops like those of Metaphor Chase and the Johnson brothers were an important part of the New England economy. But by the spring of 1806, it is clear problems on the high seas for American shipping remained unabated. In response to indignities of seized vessels and continued impressment of American sailors, Congress passed Non-Importation Act on April 18, 1806. The act banned the entry of a list of enumerated British goods into the United States. President Jefferson delayed the effective date of the new law, but the legislation foreshadowed more trouble to come. Every good crisis requires a flashpoint. The shelling of the American Navy's USS Chesapeake qualified as that moment. On June 22, 1807, the HMS Leopard, a 52-gun frigate, fired on the Chesapeake off Cape Henry. The British forcibly boarded the American ship and took off the sailors, claiming they were British deserters. President Jefferson sent the British a letter of protest, demanding an apology. 
the British response threatened an even more aggressive stand on impressment. Jefferson faced a full-scale diplomatic crisis. The president declared the enforcement of the Non-Importation Act on December 14, 1807. Four days later, Jefferson asked Congress for an embargo on foreign trade. On December 22, Congress passed the Embargo Act, forbidding all foreign trade. The act restricted all American ships to coastal trade only. The Embargo Act was likened to remedying a headache by means of decapitation. The policy was a disaster for the New England states, especially coastal towns, highly dependent upon shipping. Many towns sent remonstrances to President Jefferson, taking great umbrage with the drastic measure. Senator Timothy Pickering of Massachusetts wrote Jefferson about the particular impact to New England, suggesting, quote, those states whose farms are on the ocean and whose harvests are gathered in every sea should immediately and seriously consider how to preserve them. On September 2nd, 1808, a warrant was passed at Lemonster's town meeting, instructing a committee of Jonas Kendall, Abijah Bigelow, Timothy Boutel, John Gardner, and Bezalel Lawrence to petition the President of the United States for a repeal of the Embargo Act of 1807. The Lemonster Committee's petition read, To the President of the United States, the inhabitants of the town of Lemonster in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, assembled in legal town meeting, respectfully represent that while your petitioners are fully sensible of their obligation, as citizens of the United States, to respect the laws enacted by the constituted authorities thereof, they at the same time entertain the opinion, that it is not only their right, but their duty, in a decent and orderly manner, to express their sentiments upon public measures and to petition for a relief from such acts and laws as have a direct tendency to deprive them of all the profits hitherto derived from the cultivation of their farms, their manufactories and mechanical labors. Accustomed, from the adoption of the federal constitution, to the belief that commerce is essential to their interests and having experienced for a number of months past, great distress from the want of a market for their surplus produce, and the consequential scarcity of money, they cannot but view, with apprehension and alarm, the continuance of an embargo of unprecedented extent and unlimited duration. They cannot behold with apprehension and regret, an immense quality of shipping belonging to the citizens of the Commonwealth, laying useless and rotting at the wharfs, a vast number of seamen out of employ and from necessity, flying from our shores into the service of foreign nations, they cannot see the property of many industrious and worthy citizens sacrificed, the destruction of their fisheries, and the general stagnation of business throughout the Commonwealth, without believing that the evils which have already resulted and which we feel will result from a further continuance of the embargo, are vastly greater than the dangers to be apprehended from the capture of our vessels if allowed to trade with such ports and places to which their owners might feel willing to send them. Your petitioners therefore respectfully request of your excellency to repeal in whole or at least in part the laws laying an embargo upon our vessels, of if your excellency entertains doubts of the propriety or constitutionality of the measure, they request that Congress may be convened as early as possible that they may take the subject into consideration. Jonas Kendall. Avia Bigelow. Timothy Boutel. John Gardner. Bezilai Lawrence. Dated. Friday, September 2nd, 1808. The havoc wreaked by the embargo caused a serious political divide in the United States. Federalist New England suffered, and while the southern states closely allied with Jefferson's Democratic Republicans didn't experience either the economic pain or concerns of the North, the embargo was repealed in March of 1809 only to be replaced by equally ineffective trade policies. America's hope to maintain neutrality in overseas conflicts was becoming less successful. Increasingly, New England and its Federalist Party was being drawn into a conflict they neither wanted nor could afford. The first Lemister inhabitant elected to Congress would have a front row seat to what historians variously refer to as the Second War for American Independence, the Forgotten War, 
the war without a name, or simply the War of 1812. In 1810, the 11th Congressional District of Massachusetts covered Worcester and most of the towns northward to the New Hampshire border. When the incumbent Congressman William Stedman of Lancaster resigned to become the Worcester County Clerk of Courts, Lemonster's Abijah Bigelow successfully ran to fill the void. Like his predecessor and colleague at the bar, Abijah Bigelow also served his town as its clerk and representative to the general court. By the time Bigelow arrived in Washington, President Madison renewed the Non-Intercourse Act against trade with Great Britain, thinking, albeit mistakenly, that diplomatic relations with Napoleon had improved. A month after Bigelow arrived, Congress approved the annexation of East Florida, something that it kept secret from the American public until 1818. Lemonster argued, without success, against the secrecy of the annexation on the floor of the House. A good deal of Bigelow's correspondence with his wife during his years in Washington has survived. His earliest letter, Home to Hannah, is dated December 15, 1810. Abijah informs her that he took chamber with Mr. Allen of New Hampshire. His lodging cost the freshman congressman $10 a week, including firewood and candles. It was a convenient location located only 40 rods from the capital. He also informed his wife he was suffering from three boils on his thigh. Eight days later, Bigelow wrote his wife again, eager to hear from home. He wondered if the mail had gone astray or if the children were sick. He described the federal congressman as very agreeable sheep, and he likened the Democrats to many Merino sheep. He described some of those Democrats as being half-blooded sheep, as they often voted with the Federalists. By the time Bigelow wrote his wife a third time on December 29th, he had received two letters from her. A sprightly lady and the daughter of Reverend Gardner, she had little interest in politics. She was not afraid to admonish her husband regarding his behavior. The couple was separated by a great distance, and she told her husband, emotions are more easily felt than described. In his third letter, Abijah provided Hannah some insight on his life in the capital. I rise earlier than I do in Lemonster, and in pleasant weather walk a half mile or more, sometimes alone, and sometimes with some of the messers. I breakfast between 8 and 9, go to the house, read newspapers, documents, and adhere to business of the day. I dine at 3, sup at 7 and retire to my chamber to read and write till 10 and after. You caution me against cards and billiards, and observe that I am more fond of them than I ought to be. Your advice is good, and your rebuke just, and I trust you will never again have occasion to caution me upon the subject. Since I left Wooster, I have not seen a game of cards, billiards, I knew nothing about. I am in good company. Bigelow's first full term as a congressman would be anything but mundane. The country would be plunged into a war against Great Britain as requested by President Madison on June 1, 1812, and approved by Congress on June 18th. The causes of the war remain shrouded to this day, in part because there were many. Some attributed the war to Democratic war hawks, who sought to consolidate political power with indifference to the commercial interests of the Northeast states controlled by Federalists. Others saw it as a matter of national pride in response to the maritime bullying by the British. Still others theorized that British-held Canadian territories were a prize luring Western Democratic legislators. Whatever the reason, Federalist legislators like Abijah Bigelow opposed the war and the Democrats who launched it most vehemently. At home in Lemonster, Reverend Gardner spoke against the war from the pulpit. 
Bigelow wrote his wife a hopeful letter on June 16, 1812, just two days before the conflict became official. Good may come out of evil. The Shays insurrection, although at first extremely alarming, eventuated in good in the storm which is now gathering and threatening our country with the horrors and calamities of war, may eventually be the means of preserving our liberties. Bigelow was a vocal member of Congress during the war, opposing not only the war itself, but the methods pursued by the Madison administration to fund it. Madison doubled import duties as part of his financial solution to war costs. This was a contentious issue for the commercial Northeast. On June 22, 1812, Bigelow gave a speech from the floor of Congress opposing Madison's policy. In opposing this measure, I am not advocating the interest of the merchant but of the farmer, the tradesman and mechanic. I am not telling people whom I represent, in addition to the taxes they must pay to carry on war, they should also pay such an enormous tax to the merchant. Federalists were concerned that the Democrats' fiscal policies would lend to inflation and undermine the country's fragile economic base. Bigelow continued his appeal to reason. The public credit must be supported, or you put to hazard the best interests of the country, you hazard, indeed, the very existence of the government. The public credit of the United States and taxes were not the only concern, either in or at home in Lemonster. The nation, from the capital to the seaports of the East Coast, was subject to very serious military threats. Bigelow presaged the danger in a letter to his wife on July 15, 1813. It is not improbable you may hear reports that the British intend to pay a visit to Washington, and it's by no means improbable. But on this count you may give yourself no uneasiness, as you may rest assured I shall be prepared to place myself out of the way of danger. A little more than a year later, Bigelow's forecast came to pass when the British burned Washington in August of 1814. As the British approached the city, most of the residents, including Bigelow and the other 142 congressmen, left the city for safety in the countryside. The fleeing throng included the First Lady, Dolly Madison, who took with her a full-size portrait of George Washington, torn from the White House wall. The city was thoroughly sacked and burned, the flames consumed the White House, the Capitol, and all government buildings except the Patent Office. Upon his return to Washington in October, Bigelow wrote his wife about his dire observations. The presidential house, built of stone, like that of the wings of the Capitol, has in its outside walls but the inside is thoroughly burnt, and much of the furniture in the house was burnt. Washington was not the only place attacked in August and September of 1814. During the Battle of Baltimore, Fort McHenry was under siege, and Francis Scott Key was inspired to write the Star-Spangled Banner. In Maine, then still governed by Massachusetts, the British occupied and seed public as well as private property in the eastern portion of the district. Lemonster citizens were called upon to serve. In September of 1814, Captain Joseph Tenney of Lemonster, a carpenter, was drafted to raise a militia company to help protect the South Boston coast. Within 48 hours, Tenney enlisted 41 men in the Lemonster Artillery Company. The company marched to Boston, where they served from September 8th to November 4th, 1814. The Lemonster Artillery Company, a militia outfit, had a long and proud history. In 1837, on the observance of the 50th anniversary of the company, Jonas Kendall rose to speak. 
Gentlemen officers and soldiers of the Lemonster Company of Artillery, at your request, I reluctantly appear before you this day as the only surviving individual of those who, at the time of its organization, was elected one of the officers of the company to which you now belong. Kendall went on to recount the company's service to the country, beginning with a foreign threat. He continued, Twice only since the company was formed, has it been called upon to furnish men for active service. The first was the time when fears were entertained of invasion from France. Twenty men were then to be detached from our company to be in readiness to march at a minute's warning. The second requisition was made in the late war with England, when the whole company was marched to the vicinity of Boston, and remained in camp three months. The then commander, whom I now see before me, did honor to himself and his company by his officer-like conduct, and the strict discipline and orderly behavior of his men, and they were acknowledged to be the best company of artillery on the field. They returned to their homes and were applauded by their fellow citizens and the military discipline and martial appearance which they there acquired has never forsaken the company. Kendall was proud of the contributions of the Lemonster militia in response to threats from abroad in time of war, as well as the maintenance of order in between. During the War of 1812, Kendall gave a speech before Lemonster's Washington Benevolence Society. The address delivered on the third Monday of January 1814 was a product of a political, tumultuous time. Kendall advised a path of reason and reflection. To endeavor to preserve your liberties, to use your exertions to perpetuate your form of government, and to tread in the political footsteps of the illustrious Washington, is not all which is to be expected from members of this society. Remember that Washington sustained a moral, as well as a political character. Unless you practice his virtues, all your efforts to preserve your freedom may prove abortive. Let each member, like Washington, endeavor to support a character which his enemies will never be able to impeach. Washington Benevolent Societies were founded in 1808 as a means of attracting grassroots support for the Federalist Party. Members were given printed copies of Washington's farewell address badges and ribbons with the words Pro Patria, for country, printed on them. Before the war ended with the Treaty of Ghent on Christmas Eve 1814, a number of disaffected Federalists organized a convention that was held in Hartford, Connecticut. The convention delegates, many of whom came from Essex County, Massachusetts, converged in the Connecticut capital on October 18, 1814. They advocated for significant political reforms, and some speculated that their secret meetings even bespoke of the secession of New England from the United States. The reforms included 1. Representation would be apportioned only on the population of free persons, by not counting African American slaves as three-fifths of a person for such purposes, the South would lose seats in the House of Representatives. Two. New states could be admitted to the Union only with a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress rather than a simple majority, that would slow the addition of new western states with two senators each. 3. Congress could not pass an embargo lasting more than 60 days. 4. Two-thirds of both houses had to consent to any interdiction of commerce with a foreign country. 5. Except in the case of invasion, two-thirds of both houses would be required to declare war. 6. Presidents could serve only one term, and no state could have two presidents in succession. This was aimed at the Virginia line of succession to the presidency. Unfortunately for Jonas Kendall, Abijah Bigelow, and other Federalists, the convention's timing was poor. When the convention's resolves arrived in Washington, peace had already been achieved. Instead of a discussion about the properness of the proposed reforms, the resolves fell flat. Worse, the secret convention took on the appearance of a meeting of traitors. The convention signaled doom for the Federalist Party, even while President Madison began to adopt some of the party's nationalist policies. 
Those initiatives comprised a part of the Federalist Platform and included a second national bank, a national university, protective tariffs, a uniform national currency, and internal improvements. The shift did nothing to help the Federalists. Even in Leominster and other New England towns where Federalists held strong majorities, there was opposition. Leading Republicans from Leominster not only included the eccentric lawyer Asa Johnson, but also landlord Calvin Hale and Deacon Israel Nichols. All three were delegates to the Republican Convention held in Worcester on September 1st, 1812. With the war concluded, small towns like Leominster could look forward to a new start in the progress that peace could foster. In an ironic twist, the party of strong national identity lost its footing during the War of 1812. At the same time, the war's conclusion helped more firmly establish the United States as a full participant on the world stage. No longer would the country be a collection of states alone or a mere vestige of colonial days gone by. Thank you for joining us for episode four of Nation Rising, the story of Lemister in the context of our national history. I'm standing at the grave of Jonas Kendall Jr., as I promised in the introduction to this episode. And it's important because Jonas Kendall Jr. will have a big role in what's to come in the next decades uh, after the War of 1812. That era in U.S. history is sometimes referred to the era of good feelings. And Jonas Kendall was a national figure as well as a local figure during that period of time. So we will be examining uh, Mr. Kendall's career, both in terms of politics and local business in the episode to come. So please join us for episode five. Thank you very much.